Starting in 1996, there came a new justification to own a Game Boy. Pokemon Generation 1. It was the story of 11-year-old Pallet Town native Red, who left his home to become a Pokemon trainer. His path led to the caves, a dark forest, a haunted tower, and an abandoned power plant. Along the way, Red collected data on the 151 known Pokemon at the time, from the commonplace, to the exotic, to the mythological. This was achieved through catching them, trading them, and training them until they evolved. He fought a one-man war against Team Rocket, helped the Ghost pass into the next world, and became the league champion by beating his rival Blue. The legacy of Red was preserved through a manga series, a Gen 3 remake, and even a four-episode anime miniseries. He is the face of Gen 1 Pokemon. Discounting Pokemon Yellow, of course. That game was based on the TV show. One that's hard for me to watch as an adult. Okay, it's awesome. What does Pokemon have to do with Mario? I was just getting to that. In one of the houses in Saffron City, you'll find a Super NES that has a game involving Mario with a bucket on his head. Surprise! It's our next stop! Despite Nintendo's plans to export Mario and Wario across the world, the game would forever be trapped in Japan. In this game, Wario deploys his newest weapon to get the better of Mario with. A bucket! Fortunately for the greedy weirdo, his rival has lost all common sense and will not remove it. Then why can Luigi take it off so easily? Pretty faulty magic on Wario's part, don't you think? Of course, Mario's not the only one with this problem. If you play as Yoshi or Princess Peach, they'll lose their vision privileges too. Because the characters can't see, you have to rely on a fairy called Wanda to get to Luigi. A fairy called Wanda. What, Butch Hartman knocked this game off? Every character moves at different speeds. Peach is the slowest, Yoshi's the fastest, and Mario falls in between. You control Wanda with the mouse in order to keep your sprite out of danger by way of changing directions and manipulating certain tiles on the stage. Also, the game has a bit of a contra thing going on where a single hit kills you. The difference here, you don't respawn at the point where you die. Fortunately, you can survey the levels before you start and get an idea as to what to expect ahead of time. When the world is clear, you can get back at Wario for all the stuff he put you through. You get bonus coins for it. Level 1010 takes the cake. I must have tried 40 times conservatively to get it right. When you beat it, you get an ending where Wario crashes his plane after you drop a steel barrel over his head. And then, the game just kind of stops. Of course there's the extra world, but I never got around to playing it. The learning curve isn't so bad, though the game will get annoying during the latter stages. The music's pretty good as well. Coincidentally, the theme for World 7 sounds eerily similar to Routes 24 and 25 in Pokemon Gen 1. That was fast. It didn't fizzle out like Yoshi's Cookie, but still, it was a short video. I wonder what's next. Here we go again.